So it has become increasingly concerning to me that our testing in the state of Missouri is a problem. And I've spent every day I start thinking I'm just going to come in and do my work and go home. And invariably, a crisis emerges that um, needs urgent attention because, as we talked about last week, you guys are aware now that you understand how to interpret the curves, right? You are aware that we are just on that part of the curve. And the concern of people, um, the psychology of when this is a problem usually doesn't occur until it's too late to make an impact on things. And if you can intervene here in any health-related issue, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, HIV, or an acute pandemic, early intervention pays way more dividends than trying to get GM to make more uh, ventilators. Okay? Ventilators will save one person. Intervening here can save hundreds of thousands of people. That's why I can't stop screaming about why time is of an essence. The thing that dawned on me today um, is how poor the testing is in the state of Missouri. And the, I'll just walk through how the process works um, so that you guys understand because I think we need to get pressure from everybody to improve our testing. Testing was identified as one of the major problems four weeks ago, five weeks ago, when the first patient hit Seattle. I mean, that was more than that. But, you know, that was originally the problem. Um, when I started worrying about things right before spring break, which would have been about March 14th, testing was my biggest concern. And the government said testing is our biggest concern. And guess what's still the biggest concern today? Testing. Why? Because we have too few tests, it's too cumbersome, and one thing that is not being widely discussed is what happens if you have false negatives. So some important lab things you guys need to understand is whenever your doctor orders a lab test on you, Usually, as the lay people, we assume that that test is either positive or negative, right? It's an on-off switch. Yet, what you don't realize is every test has flaws, including false negatives, false positives. So sometimes there's things about a test that make a good screening test, to make a diagnosis. Sometimes there's things about a test that make it a very uh, good diagnostic test because it's specific, but it only recognizes a few of the people that actually have the disease. And so, even for simple labs, thank you, Suji, such as um, sodium, potassium, urinalysis, there are false negative and false positive rates on all those tests. So, most of them are so small, they're not practically relevant. But when you're dealing with this crisis, I can't emphasize how concerning any degree of false negatives is. And this was highlighted by a case where um, somebody I ordered a test on somebody and it came back negative, yet that patient continues to have fevers to this date. Um, about 10 days into symptoms, okay? And this de-identified person has been ruled out for strep, flu, um, is otherwise healthy. I can't think of a single thing else that could be causing what's going on in this patient, unless they have a Okay? So I got to, here's how the process works. In the state of Missouri, if you're a healthcare worker and you have an exposure, uh, you are prioritized and we're supposed to get a result back within 24 hours. Okay? That seems great. One, where do you go to get your test if you're sick? Okay? So you need a doctor to order that in the state of Missouri. And that doctor has to send you a testing site. Okay? And the testing sites, Currently here are, I think, Quest and LabCorp, or coming through our emergency room. Where if we send all our employees to the emergency room, that's obviously creating a public health problem in our hospital. We're actually bringing people into our emergency room just to test, which doesn't make sense. 
And so, you know, regardless of where we get the test, the way it works is, in the state of Missouri, is you do a nasal specimen, okay? It's a god-awful test where they jam a rod about halfway to your brain, um, and then they pull it out and they stick it in media, okay? If you've ever had a flu test, it's the same thing. It's not very comfortable, is my point. Um, so what they do is then they put it into the thing, and then they call a courier and say, we got a test that needs to go to the state lab. And so the courier shows up, wherever the testing site is, picks it and takes it to the county health department, in this case, Cass County. Cass County has a delivery, a courier system to get it to the state that leaves one time a day. I think it's approximately noon. I, I, I didn't look this up. But. So my patient came in about 1.30 in the afternoon. I don't know exactly remember, but it was afternoon before they got tested. By the time it got to the county, it had just missed the cutoff. So guess what? That test sits in a tube in the lab, you know, in the medium, there it is, with the virus in there, probably in a refrigerator overnight until noon the next day. So we've already missed the 24-hour state mandated cutoff or state record or promise of a 24-hour turnaround. Next, a courier comes to the county uh, and picks that up, takes it to the state lab in Jeff City. So picture a scientist on their bench with a machine that can have 150 tests at one time and a backlog of tubes that's about 3,000, okay? And all of a sudden we walk in with a tube and say, hey, this is a priority. Well, let's see, where's it sticking to that stack? Well, it's above all these other ones, but these are all healthcare workers anyway, so we'll put it in there and, gosh, it didn't get in today's run, so we're going to have to run it tomorrow, but it's, it's, worked, it's working its way to the top. So another 24 hours went by. They finally ran the test. The state has a requirement that the specimen must be received by them within 72 hours, or else they just completely throw it away. It's a useless test. Okay? I found this out by talking to the state scientist at Jeff City this morning. And so my test just came in underneath that 72 hours. And what happens with this virus? Now, ironically, you would think this virus, as you're hearing news reports about how it can stay on a cruise ship handrail for two weeks, if you put any human, anything, within any contact proximity to this virus, it completely degrades, instantly. We have, this is an R, what's called an RNA virus. So it's not DNA, it's RNA. So back in high school, uh, biology, you learn DNA goes to RNA and then it goes to protein. RNA is exceedingly unstable. When you work in the lab, you have to basically wear a hazmat suit to run any test on it because if it even touches a, a human uh, cell of any kind, it will get digested. And that's just a protection mechanism that we have against RNA viruses. So, this is sitting there in a nasal swab with pieces of your cells and all your snot and everything, just digesting for 72 hours. And then we're asking the state lab to run it. And, they're, and, and so this is really what's scary. So I said to the scientist, I go, what's your current state lab's false negative rate? And his answer was, I don't know. Well, how come you don't know? Do you guys run it against the gold standard there? No. We use the CDC as a gold standard because we're using their test materials and their primers and their whole setup. Okay? Well, that's fine. What's CDC's false negative rate? I don't know. And I said, well, can you find out an answer? He goes, I'll talk to the lab manager and get back to you. That was about four hours ago. Meanwhile, I started getting a little bit worried about that number. I scoured the CDC. The CDC at some place, and I can't, I can't, don't quote me specifically, but at somewhere I thought I saw 3%, right, as their reported false negative, and I don't know, remember whether that's the COVID-19 or the COVID-2012. COVID-2012 was what we call SARS in the news media, or no, that was MERS. COVID-2002, COVID-02 was the SARS outbreak. COVID. 12 was the MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus outbreak, none of us heard about because it didn't really take hold here. 
um, and now we're in COVID-19. <coughs> so the best I could find was maybe 3%, but the CDC has very concerning language that says, uh, because there's any false negatives, you have to assume that a patient with symptoms uh, has the test. And that's all I needed to hear. Has the, or has the disease or not the test. But what you're seeing in the lay media, if you, if you Google false negative rates for our PCR-based test now, almost everybody, every scientist or doctor is quoting 30%. Okay, and, I, and, and there's some scientific basis to it. I have the Chinese study um, that was published recently showing the difference between nasopharyngeal swabs, oral swabs, and then their gold standard was bronchial alveolar lavage patients. They're, so anybody that had a bronchial alveolar, alveolar lavage, PCR was considered 100%. And then they compared that to their nasal swabs and oral swabs. Early in the disease onset, within the first few days of symptoms, during the peak of their illness, and then during the convalescent phase. And that's probably where this is, this 30% is coming from, because it is unbelievable to realize that even in a very controlled setting where your PCR lab is right next to your specimen, the nasal swab has a false negative rate compared to a bronchial alveolar lavage in the exact same patient that was positive at the same time or later, that's unacceptably high at around 30%. And I don't know the exact numbers because I need to read the paper in detail. I'm terrified by this. So what does this mean? It means that in a hypothetical situation where you work in a healthcare setting, if you are sick and you have a coronavirus test that's negative and now you've recovered, then if your company policy states that you can go back to work, you can go back to work. Yet we know the virus can shed up to 34 days after the symptom onset. You guys see where I'm going? So you could be day 14 after even full quarantine and have a negative test to show your boss, I'm negative for strep, flu, and coronavirus. I feel great. But now you're walking around the halls with your colleagues and other patients if you're in healthcare setting. By the way, very proud of all of you guys for wearing masks. And let me explain some of the side on masks. So the CDC obviously supported, recommends that we wear masks. They're not mandating it, but you can't mandate something like that. That's ridiculous. The reason you're wearing a mask is not to protect you. It's to protect me. And that's a really important concept. Because you guys aren't the dangerous one. I am. And you can say that for each one of you. So you guys could be silent spreaders because we work in a high-risk environment. And, and one of us will be, based on statistics, it's about 10% of the population are silent spreaders. So out of every 10 people, one of you is a silent spreader. You're innocently going to come to work. I have no problem with you coming to work. There's no reason to believe you're sick, right? You guys don't have a fever, you don't have a cough, you don't feel sick at all. Yet you have the virus and you're unloading it just like anybody else. And the biggest risk is respiratory droplets, both just floating around in the air. But if you happen to have a little cough, or you choke on your lunch, or you sneeze because you have allergies this time of year, guess what? You just launched that virus 30 feet in front of you, and it went on every surface around. So this is to protect our environment against us as an individual. So you're doing your part to protect me by wearing the mask, and I appreciate every one of you for doing that. Thank you. So when people wear masks, tell them thank you. Don't point out and get mad at the people that aren't wearing masks, because I found that um, trying to point out or, or you know make fun of people or make people feel bad because they're not doing what you're doing isn't a, isn't an effective technique. People have reasons for doing what they're doing, and you're not going to change their dogma or their paradigm unless you do it in a non-threatening manner. And making fun of people or uh, denigrating them is not an effective manner. This goes back to grade schools, right? On the playground, it's not effective. So my biggest concern of the day is false negatives at the state level. What do we do about that? I don't have an answer other than I'm trying to put pressure on the state of Missouri to actually give us an answer. Because I think it's I think the state of Missouri 
and then everybody underneath them needs to make a policy that takes into account the likelihood that we are a disaster within a disaster. Meaning, yes, the whole coronavirus thing is a disaster and it's gonna, it's gonna be here really soon. It is here, but this is just an early easy part of it because we're right here on the curve. But we're gonna be here really soon. Okay, and the other problem is, if you truly have a false negative rate of 30%, and if, like Italy is trying to put into place standards for getting people back to work, so that makes a lot of sense. When can you safely get your whole economy kickstarted again? Well, when people can go around safely without spreading it. And what do you need to do that? You need another negative test after you're better to be scientifically valid. You can't just say 14 days. That's an estimate. That's, a, that's as good as they got right now. But you're putting people out in society that are still spreading virus. You also need not only the RT-PCR test, which is what I'm talking about, this PCR-based test, you also need serologic testing, which I talked about last week, um, although I don't think it was a recorded session. And basically, you're going to have to be aware of this really soon, that there are two types of tests. And the one I've been screaming about this morning is a PCR test. Theoretically, it has an extremely high sensitivity, meaning it can detect one strand of viral RNA as a positive. Now, in practice, your viral inoculum in the test tube, if you're super sick and you have a ton of virus, it's going to be easier to detect than if you just have a single strand. You know when they do those crime scene investigation things, they find a droplet of blood on some unsuspecting piece of equipment? They're running PCR tests. Um, off the DNA, and they can take that little microscopic drop of blood that you can't even see and amplify it and get a human genome out of it. It's a pretty powerful technique, and it's all based on the fact that if you have one string of RNA and you have these what's called primers on each end, within 20 minutes you can run a cycle and make a duplicate of that one and a duplicate of this one, and then if you run the cycle again, you go from one strand to two strand, two strand to four strand, four strand to eight, eight to 16. If you guys, somebody do this, I did it to my brother-in-law this weekend. If you want to understand the power of exponentials, uh, tell your kid you're gonna give them a penny on day one and then double it every day. And have them figure out how much money they're gonna have at the end of one month, 30 days. You know how much money you're gonna have? Anybody ever done this? Five million dollars. If you double a penny every day for 30 days, you'll have five million dollars. That's how exponentials work. You know how much you had on day 29? 2.5 million. Right? So this test works because you can start with a low number and expand it really rapidly, but it only works if your specimen is good. And I think that's where the false negative problem is. Not from the actual bench top machine. I think that's fine. The quality control of that, they have their, their positive control and their negative control that they put into it each day, and they show that their assay works fine, that's fine. This transport of this specimen is a major, major problem. Okay, the second kind of test you need to know about is what's called a serological test. Serological, and this is basically your antibodies, IgM and IgG, and without going through a lot of details of the immune response because some of you were here last week. Early on in an infection, if you get infected here, after seven to 14 days, you get IgM antibodies that come on and they're the initial protection, but they're also the initial diagnostic test. And then shortly after that, you have lasting lifelong immunity with what's called IgM or IgG antibodies. So, IgM is your first wave, and IgG is your protective lifelong immunity. That's why you guys still have antibodies against your measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine from when you were a kid. That's why you still have uh, chickenpox antibodies. That's why you still have antibodies against every single flu vaccine you've had over your lifetime. The only reason you have to do those every year is because the actual virus changes, not your immune response. So if the flu ever comes around that we had 10 years ago, which it can, then you're already protected. The vaccine we got 10 years ago. The bottom line is these tests can be effective at maybe day 10 to 14 or later. 
But before you send somebody back out into the world, we have pretty good reason to believe that once you get these antibodies, you're likely not going to get sick or as sick with coronavirus again, certainly not at a life-threatening level. Okay, you've heard about the repeat infections second time around. Theoretically, you can get flu twice in the season if you don't have a good antibody response, right? So really what you want is great protective antibodies and a negative PCR test, and then I'm fine with you going back to work. Aside from that, I have a lot of scientific reservations that you're safe to be in this world. To me. No offense, but I don't want to work with you if you don't meet those two standards. Any questions? But we're not doing the, sero the serology tests, right? We're not doing those. They don't, they're not widely available now. I got, it was a really weird weekend. I got called by a Kansas City company called Core Medica on Saturday. I had a guy show up in my driveway with a box of 25 tests. And he said, can you help me? We have a, we have a lab that does this. Our FDA approval should be today, maybe today, Monday or Tuesday. We have the serological tests. They're based out of Geneva, Switzerland, where they already have all the data. And they just so happen, just by chance, have their United States office, at least some Missouri, right next to St. Lucie's. And through a weird, somebody knows somebody, somebody knows them, they called me and said, we have to validate our test locally. I said, sure, I can help, I think. I gotta talk to our CEO and see if they're on board. Which, you know, from all the reasons that you don't need to know from a legal and a uh, study patient kind of standpoint, there has to be some regulatory things in place before you can do it. But yeah, I expect this test to be up and going we, from this company or multiple other companies really soon. Ironically, I just saw on the internet, you can buy a home PCR machine <laughs> um, and run the test in your home for like 150 bucks. I can't, I can't explain to you how, what a concept that is. I mean, back when I was in grad school, I used to do experiments at home with my wife as a nurse. And she'd work weekend package and I stayed home with the kids. But I'd bring all my science stuff home and I'd run experiments out of my refrigerator and kitchen cabinet. Um, <laughs> you had to keep up somehow. And then she watched the kids during the week. You, know? you could do all the science in your garage. It's not hard. It's just expensive by the way. The answer to your question is yes, I anticipate these tests will be available very soon. Either through the finger stick test, that's what they're talking about. When you hear about the finger stick test, it's this one. And again, is that a good diagnostic test? Maybe not, because if you if you have symptoms here and you do a finger stick here, you might not have enough IgM yet to test positive. But if you're false False negative rate is 30% with the PCR test, it really doesn't matter. So why does Missouri have it? Do you know why Missouri has so many problems? I mean, it's Kansas. No, I suspect it's every single state. I just happen to be working in Missouri, right. so I focused on that. Right. I don't have the effort and the time. I mean, obviously, I came in. I'm supposed to be doing clinic in Appleton City from here this morning. I haven't even called a patient yet. <laughs> this, is, this takes priority in my personal world. Um, because it affects us. And again, everything starts here for me. That's why I'm here. Because this is my home base. And you guys are part of my work family. So, I'm doing everything in my power to protect you guys. And you guys can protect your family. Et cetera, et cetera. Because I can't, you can't just start. I, I tried to talk to everybody the first week of this, three weeks ago, and I just, that was all over this. So everything started here. That's fine. All right, go back to work, guys. Thank you. Wear your mask you. and politely convince your colleagues to wear their mask. Thank you. And does anybody have any topics for tomorrow? It can be anything you hear on the news. It can be anything on Facebook. I don't care. What do we do at home? What do you do at home? Do you, do at home? Um, you know what I mean? I don't know if your wife's working outside the home. Here, here, you know. well, there's a YouTube video on this.